So this, um, this is a chance for me to ask and make sure, is this the right workshop for you? Because your time is not a renewable resource um, and it will not hurt my feelings if you realize uh, that you want to be in the other workshop. So uh, I will talk a little bit about the topic and uh, the slide deck, and then I will introduce myself. So today I'll be focusing mostly on BigQuery with some R uh, at the end, but BigQuery is the featured player here. So what is BigQuery? BigQuery is Google Cloud's fully managed petabyte scale, so very large uh, and cost-effective analytics data warehouse. And BigQuery allows you to run analytics over really big quantities of data. So today we're going to talk about cloud computing, uh, BigQuery in particular, how to work with SQL queries within BigQuery, and finally, how to integrate that work into R. All right, so that is our topic. Um, if folks have questions about the scope or what's included or excluded, feel free to drop that into chat and I will answer that. Uh, a few notes about this slide deck. So this slide deck was built in Quarto. So I'm going to drop the link to all the materials and you'll see in the readme uh, that there's a link to all of our slide decks. So there's three slide decks, one for roughly each hour, uh, but we'll see how they all fall out. Um, and the slide decks were built in Quarto. So I actually developed the slides in our studio. And if you want to open your own version of these slides, so um, not base your participation on what I'm showing in Zoom, but on your own pace, where you can go a little bit faster or a little bit slower, that's completely fine. Those slides are there for you. And these commands will help you navigate these slides more easily. So um, for example, you can type the question mark and that will give you keyboard shortcuts that you can use to sort of navigate through these slides. A little bit about me, because I have not properly introduced myself yet. My name is Joy Payton, and I use she, her pronouns. And my primary job is as a teaching data scientist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, the nation's first hospital for children. And there I teach investigators, so researchers principally, how to use tools like R, Python, SQL, uh, the Linux command line, version control with Git, and other topics. You can reach me most easily uh, by contacting me on LinkedIn. And I do love networking with my peers and learners. So please don't be shy about reaching out. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to report. I don't work for Google or the R Consortium or Posit, so I won't have any personal gain from talking about these technologies today. Uh, that said, I am always interested in developing conflicts of interest. So if you have a good one, please reach out to me and let's talk. Uh, finally, I like to say that I know a little about a lot and I teach a broad range of skills. So I am very much a generalist and I am often teaching in rooms with people who know more than me. So if you know a better way of doing something that I am teaching, please let everyone know. Uh, I try not to have a thin skin about that. Um, so let us know if you know of a, a better way or you have a suggestion to improve on what I'm teaching. Importantly, in a class like this, in a workshop like this, not everyone is moving at the same pace. You may come with a lot of background in uh, this topic or be a complete beginner. So I really encourage you to grab these links. Um, the link also that's in chat will take you to sort of all the information. Um, if you want to skip ahead or hang back today, that's totally fine. The slides are there for you. Uh, again, you can use those in a web browser. Just open that, those slides and navigate through them. Um, and the, the GitHub repository also has other um, materials that might be useful, like SQL queries that we're going to, to work with today. And finally, feedback is very important to me because it's how I can improve as an instructor. So please let me know if I'm uh, talking too fast or you hear a lot of background noise, I have my window open. Um, and by all means, provide feedback when the conference organizers request it because your feedback really helps our medicine support uh, and mentor instructors like me so that we do the best job with your time that we can. Let's talk about our itinerary. We have a, a roughly three hour uh, workshop today and we have time for breaks along the way. 
And so roughly, again, depending on how quickly we move, uh, this is our itinerary. Uh, we're going to start in the first hour, just concentrating on arriving, arriving to Google Cloud Platform and to BigQuery. We'll dip our toes into GCP, Google Cloud Platform, and understand a little bit more about BigQuery. Uh, then we'll take a break and we'll go into the second hour, which concentrates on using BigQuery. And if you have experience in structured query language in SQL, that's fantastic. Uh, if it's your first time, that's okay too. If you've never heard of SQL or, or never worked with it, uh, some of the material might be a little bit challenging, but I'm going to give you uh, the queries that you need. So you'll, you'll leave with that information. So stay with us, even if it feels a little challenging um, when we're working in this second hour with SQL. And then in the third hour, we'll work on integrating these tools uh, with uh, what you may know already rather well, which is R. So first hour today, we're going to start by getting you set up to use Google Cloud Platform and get you started in BigQuery. This is a hands-on workshop. And we'll load up uh, some public data sets and then uh, we'll do a, a little bit of exploration of data. So this is not uh, the time when I'm going to do a cloud 101, right? To go over what is GCP, what is cloud, what is AWS? That's, a, that's another workshop. Uh, but it's a very short approximation. We can say that public cloud providers are big companies, uh, tech companies usually, like Google, uh, Google sells services as part of Google Cloud Platform, or Amazon, um, Amazon sells services as part of Amazon Web Services. And these big companies rent out computational resources. So this could be things like computing systems, things like VMs, virtual machines, or containers. It could be data systems, like a SQL database or a graph database. Uh, access to large models, like generative AI, if you wanted access to say chat GPT um, or storage like object storage or persistent disks um, and network solutions like dedicated IP addresses or secure networks that you can use to keep different parts of your business network separate from one another. So why, why does this matter to you? Why is this important to attendees at R Medicine? Well, medical computation is increasingly large and complex and most of us work at um, hospitals or some other businesses or nonprofits where the prime purpose of that organization is clinical care or research. Um, our motivation for existing is not to run a data center, but to help patients, right? For those of us who work at hospitals, let's say. Uh, but many of our institutions used to have to do that in the past, have a data center, because there was no alternative. Uh, but now alternatives exist. There's a competitive, affordable, high quality, well-run, top of the line, sort of set of cloud providers. And they are experts in their field, just like you are an expert in yours, right? Or um, the, the other leaders in our organizations are experts in medicine, let's say. So a lot of medical systems are deciding that some of their resources are better spent paying these cloud experts to run part of their major infrastructure or software uh, or networking uh, part of their business instead of trying to recruit and retain talent, um, build or rent huge in infrastructure uh, and things like that. So I'm not going to get into you know, cloud, no cloud, which services in medicine go well on cloud. That's outside the scope of this. Um, but just wanted to orient you a little bit uh, to why cloud matters in medicine, uh, since this is the R Medicine Conference. All right, so if you already have a GCP account, and you know what that means, uh, you have a couple of options. One is that go get a cup of coffee and come back here in 15 minutes. You can use your existing account. Um, you might be over your free tier usage for the month, so you might spend a couple of dollars today to do this workshop. Or even if you already have an account, you can stick around, create a new account with a brand new sort of bolus of uh, free money from Google to do this work, all right? Uh, so that is just for people who are already GCP users. To get started in Google Cloud Platform, GCP, you need a Google identity. And for most of us, that is a Gmail address, right? If you have a Gmail account, 
um, and you have not yet signed up for GCP, you are good to go. Now, if you already have a GCP account and you want to get a new set of free uh, GCP trial uh, services, you will need to create a new Google identity. So for example, I, as an instructor, I teach a lot of these workshops. So I, I create a new one every time I teach a workshop because I'm always creating free trials, uh, using a bit and then it expires, creating a, another account, getting more free trial, et cetera. So if you do need to create a new Google identity, you can go to accounts.google.com. Let me just copy and paste that. All right, so uh, for those of you, I'll just start the timer now. Uh, for those of you who do need to create uh, a new account, whoops, let's start that. Those of you who do need to create a new account, um, go ahead and go to accounts.google.com. I would definitely suggest doing this in incognito mode, um, especially if you like me have multiple sort of Google identities. I have a work Google identity. I have a personal Google identity. I have an adjunct professor Google identity, et cetera. So um, if you use Chrome, uh, use an incognito browser. If you're using uh, Safari, it's private. I'm sorry, I'm a Mac user, so I'm not sure what it's called uh, in, in Windows if you're using Microsoft Edge. But whatever the version of incognito or not logged in is what you want to open. Uh, and you can go to accounts.google.com uh, and create a new account. So uh, if, if you haven't created a Gmail address before, uh, the way it works is you give them your first name and you kind of tell them why you're going to use Google. So I just say my personal use. Uh, they offer you a couple of uh, generally terrible suggestions uh, for how you uh, might want to name your new account. And so um, I know my slides are kind of small, but I just created a one-off that is joy, that's my first name, dot rmedicine.2024, because that way I'll remember what it was for, uh, because I didn't like any of the suggestions they gave me. And then you create it, and they ask you a lot more nosy questions about who you are and how you're going to use Google. So um, you can say what you want to those questions. All right. Um, and so I will say at the end, it is probably useful, even if it's a throwaway account just for today, um, it's probably still a good idea to add your mobile phone or a secondary email address. Um, just because if you decide to pick up what you started here in three weeks or six weeks, you wanna uh, remember kind of like what we did today, uh, but you forgot maybe the password that you set for this throwaway uh, Gmail account, it's handy to go ahead and connect this uh, account to your existing typical one. All right, I'm gonna give you a couple more minutes for that and I will take a look at chat and see if there's anything else, any other questions? Oh, yep, yeah, thank you, incognito. Excellent. Well, we have at least three continents covered. Africa, Australia, North America. Uh, anyone here from Europe? South America? Asia? Antarctica? That would be a real coup. Oh, great. We've got Europe. Perfect. All right, well, um, I'll invite everyone to open uh, an incognito tab, or if you know that you're going to use 
um, an existing identity and you have uh, that identity logged in already in a in a um, a browser, that's fine. But I know that I have multiple identities in the Googleverse, so I always like to do an incognito window. Uh, and the next thing that we're going to do is actually sign up for GCP. So I'm going to put something, uh, a URL in the chat. And I will go ahead and move on to the next slide because I think we're, we've given folks enough time to set up their new identities. All right, so you have a Google identity. You either have a Gmail address that pre-existed or you just made one. So that means you can now go to console.cloud.google.com. Please do that. Um, and there's a couple things that you need to do. First, you have to agree to the terms of GCP, um, and that's fairly easy. And then you need to activate your free trial. And that has two steps. Uh, so we're going to go through this in the next couple of slides. And please, if you're struggling with this, if there's something that uh, I moved too quickly or you're having a different experience than what I predicted, uh, please don't be afraid to let me know, come off mute and say something or um, go into chat because this is a hands-on uh, sort of lab opportunity and I don't want you to get left behind, all right? So uh, I'd rather be a little too slow in the beginning and sort of get everyone caught up than be too fast uh, and leave people behind. All right, so let's just go through this uh, and I'll use my slide deck, um, but uh, you should be able to follow along uh, in your own uh, Google Cloud platform console. So hopefully, um, you see something like what's on your screen uh, when you go to console.cloud.google.com and you hit start or try for free, you see something that says, hey, welcome. Are, are you willing to agree to the terms of service? Um, it's always a good idea to follow that link and read the Google Cloud Platform terms of service. Um, so I will leave it to your uh, discretion as to uh, whether reading that uh, click wrap agreement is something that you want to spend time on. But that is just a click wrap agreement where you're going to uh, click to highlight or fill in that checkbox and then hit agree and continue. So that's the first step, fairly straightforward. And now the free trial. So um, it will you know, suggest, hey, would you like to start a free trial? And if you say, yes, please, I would love a free trial. Um, they will ask for a couple of uh, pieces of information. Um, so you will have to enter uh, a credit card number. And this is standard across cloud providers, by the way. Uh, Google will not charge you, I promise. Um, they say it there, and I have had a number of these as an instructor, and they have never charged me. Uh, this is not one of those cases where if you forget to turn off the free trial, uh, it'll start charging. No, no, you have to manually turn on and agree to charges in the future, right? If you run off the end of your free tier, things will just stop working and that's all, right? You will not get charged. Um, this is to make sure you are a real person. So I know this is annoying uh, and I apologize. If you don't add a credit card, uh, it's possible that, yep, this is being recorded. Um, good question. Uh, so this is being recorded um, and uh, will be posted at some point after the, the conference. And additionally, you have the slides. Um, so if you do need to pop in and pop out, I know we're busy, some of us have clinic. Um, so feel free to pop in, pop out. Uh, the slides are there for you. And we've got breaks too, where I'll be able to help folks catch up. So, uh, but I, as I was saying, if you don't have a credit card, it is it's possible that you'll be able to use what's called a sandbox account. Uh, that used to be the case. I haven't tried it recently, but you, you used to be able to have a sandbox account without uh, attaching uh, a credit card. However, it is highly likely uh, that with the sandbox account, you won't be able to do everything that we're doing today. So after you tell them who you are and give them your credit card number, they'll ask you a few questions about how you plan to use Google Cloud Platform so that they can market to you better. So I leave it to your discretion to answer those 
in whatever way uh, you please. You can answer those however you want. So I'm going to pause here for about five minutes because I've given you a lot of information and a lot of things to do. Um, so I will set that timer. And I will be available on chat to answer questions. Uh, if you are caught up, grab a cup of coffee, and I'll see you here in five minutes. All right, if you are walking up to your computer with your cup of coffee, we're about to get started.
All right, so my hope is that everyone um, has been able to sign up for Google Cloud Platform um, or is using your existing Google Cloud Platform. So um, it is a good time to orient ourselves to the Google Cloud Platform console toolbar. Um, as a reminder, you log into Google, to Google Cloud Platform or GCP by going to console.cloud.google.com. Dot com. And I'm going to draw your attention to a few things here that will come in handy. So on the far left is the burger menu, which you can use to access GCP resources like storage, compute, and network. Uh, we call it the burger menu because it looks like uh, a hamburger. Uh, next to it, the Google Cloud logo will take you to your project dashboard if you click on that. Then there's a project selector. There's a little triangle that you can click on to expand. And it also shows the currently selected project. You might have one that says my first project. Uh, in the middle there, there's a search bar. I did not bother labeling that. And to the right, there's a bunch of tiny uh, icons. First, there's Gemini, uh, which is a little star. And that is a helper chat bot that can help you answer questions that you might have about GCP. And we'll experiment with that in a minute. Then there's the Cloud Shell logo. And it looks like a command prompt because it takes you to the Bash shell. Uh, if you are Bash scripting or you're used to uh, working from command line, um, every project that you build comes with a small VM that's spun up for free. And that allows you to use the Google command line tools in the console. So if, if phrases like uh, the SDK make sense to you, uh, the, the Google Cloud Platform SDK is already installed. Um, so you can start using sort of the command line there if that's the way you prefer to work. We will not do that today. That's a little bit advanced. Uh, next to that, you might have a bell. Um, in the screenshot I took, I have a number. Uh, and this icon is for notifications or messages that you might want to read. Um, uh, then there's a help button uh, followed by a kebab menu uh, that has additional menu items. Um, and the kebab menu has more to do with GCP settings overall, like the terms of service or billing. Um, and finally, and most importantly, the account. So if you're like me and you have several Google identities, one of which is work and one of which is your personal, um, it can be really important uh, to make sure that you are who you think you are. You do not want to be uh, doing uh, accidentally expropriating uh, work healthcare data into your personal account uh, or vice versa. So in the screenshot here, I actually hovered over that J because my name is Joy. I have a lot of things that start with J. So I hovered over it so that I could see what email address popped up there. Um, and that is uh, to show like what identity am I? So I just wanna take a moment. I, I, unfortunately, I can't poll because I don't have um, uh, host uh, uh, privileges on this Zoom, but uh, just briefly in chat, can you let us know, uh, were you able to log in to Google Cloud Platform uh, using your Google identity? Um, and are you seeing this Google Cloud Platform toolbar? Uh, let, let me know. Uh, normally in a physical class, I could look around and see some smiling faces. So uh, give me a, an emoji or a yes or a no, wait, slow down. Perfect. Thanks for the feedback, everyone. Oh, no, Jim and I chat thought. That's interesting. Oh, that's strange. I wonder why I got it. Some folks are reporting that they're not getting the Gemini chatbot. Well, we'll see. If you have it, I have a couple of things for us to, to do. Uh, but it could be that there's just not, uh, that it's only rolled out for specific people. And there's something about my profile, even though it's brand new, uh, that gave it to me. Maybe they're, maybe uh, Google is being a little sneaky and they know that I'm actually secretly, I have seven of these accounts. So. Well, I'll introduce it to you. We'll fly through the Gemini slides. It sounds like a lot of you don't have it, uh, but it is pretty nifty. Um, so I wanna, I kinda wanna share it as a sneak preview with you. So, all right. Okay, so if you do have, if you do have Gemini, 
uh, you can do this. Uh, uh, if you don't, uh, trust me on it. Uh, you can click on that Gemini star and a little uh, little window opens and you can enter a prompt. And this is like chat GPT, where you can ask a question and Gemini, which is a generative AI bot, will uh, try and answer that. Uh, so I thought it might be interesting to ask about BigQuery and medicine. So I said, explain how BigQuery can be useful in medicine. Um, and keep in mind, uh, this is generative AI. Uh, so if you have worked with large language models or you've read about them or been to events or uh, webinars or you know any education about them, you know that they are language models, not truth models. Um, so you need to take anything they say with a grain of salt. Uh, their goal is to mimic human language, not to accurately mimic uh, the state of the world and reality. Um, but it, it does do a pretty good job. Um, and so, you know, if you do have that or you have it in the future, give it a shot, ask it questions. Um, like what is GCS or um, how do hospitals use GCP or, or anything like that? And it'll uh, do a, a decent job of answering that question. Um, however, um, you do have to be aware of mistakes and hallucinations and differences and problems. So for example, I asked uh, within the GCP console uh, for tips on how to save money in BigQuery. And one of the tips was uh, use a limit to reduce cost. But that is actually not factually true um, because a limit is applied after all the data is read. It reduces the number of rows that you see, but not the cost of the computation. And that's what you're charged on. Uh, and ironically enough, so that's on the left, but on the right, ironically enough, I asked sort of in, in google.com, the search engine, uh, hey, does the use of limit save money in BigQuery? And it answered correctly. Um, so just, you know, you can certainly use generative AI, and that includes uh, if you use chat GPT to help you write R code or Python code, that can be super useful. Um, I love using uh, generative AI, but, but you do have to practice with a little bit of skepticism. All right, uh, so let's move on to the GCP technology that we're going to talk about mostly today. Um, this is BigQuery. Uh, it is a, a large data warehouse, and it is not built to support online transaction processing. If you know what that is, if you don't know what that is, that's fine. Uh, what I'm driving at here is that BigQuery is not just a giant MySQL database. Uh, it's not just like a giant uh, epic clarity uh, blown up to size, because it's not really meant for uh, online transactions, like fast moving, often changing transactions. It actually has some architectural differences that make it optimized for big data and for data analysis in particular, that makes it uh, a cost savings uh, response, right? It's, it's built for data analysis in bulk. For example, uh, storage in BigQuery is based on columns, not on rows. And if you think about uh, online transaction processing where you're dealing with uh, customers or patients uh, and changes in real time to their status. It's often row based. So some row representing a patient or a customer or a shipment uh, or a product in a store, that row needs to be updated to change a price or to indicate that something shipped or an address change for a single customer, right? Uh, these are uh, small little changes that are row based. But that's not how we work with data when we're doing data analysis at scale. We really are looking generally at pulling whole columns. So I want to look at uh, the entire column of patient birth weight, right? And do some trends on that. Maybe do some group uh, statistical measures. Um, or I might pull a customer's total build amount and do sort of a distribution of that or show how it's changed over time. So I'm pulling entire columns. Additionally, I think it can be useful to point out that BigQuery has its own structured query language or SQL dialect, um, which is called standard SQL. It is mostly what you're used to if you use SQL, um, but there's a couple of differences. And as I'm doing live queries, I might trip up because uh, I'm used to using other multiple uh, flavors of SQL. So I do trip up and make mistakes, but 
the nice thing is this is a really established uh, like SQL dialect. So if you Google um, BigQuery SQL, how do I blah, 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 you'll be able to get a lot of really well-written documentation around that. But let's get your hands dirty a little bit. Uh, and we're going to actually uh, create a project uh, and start using BigQuery. But to get started using BigQuery, you need to understand a little bit about how GCP as a whole organizes its resources. So in GCP, we organize resources by project. And that's a little different than say AWS, which is by user. Uh, this is a little bit different. So a project can optionally uh, be nested under a folder, uh, if you wanna have folders to organize your work and or organizations. Uh, but we're just going to be using projects today. So when we create a project, uh, we assign a project name we do and a project ID. Um, Google is the one that assigns the project number. Uh, and then once we create that project, that's when we can add any resources that we want like BigQuery or a Kubernetes cluster or uh, Google Cloud Storage or data or disk, whatever it is that we want to add, but we have to create that project first. All right, so let's get your uh, hands on started again. We're going to get you started actually using Google Cloud Platform. So we'll do these three things um, as an exercise. And I'm going uh, to show you the slides, uh, but I'd love for you to follow along uh, on your uh, own system. So we'll start in the next slide. We'll create a new project with a name and ID that work for you. Uh, then we'll find BigQuery, uh, open it, assign it as a, a re resource, and we'll take a look at some public data sets. So the project selector, if you remember on your toolbar, that's that little drop down menu that probably says something like my first project. Um, I, I don't particularly care for my first project as a project name, and usually the project ID is not particularly uh, helpful or it's not good at reminding me what it is. So I'm going to propose a new project. So I'm going to invite you to click on that project selector and then select new project. And when you select new project, it will allow you to add a project name. And that project name can be whatever you want. Uh, you can call it Bob, you can call it Our Medicine 2024, um, Whatever you want to call it is fine. And you can optionally alter the project ID. Google will offer you a project ID. You're welcome to type in that box and say, this project ID doesn't really work for me. But you can't name it whatever you want, right? You can give a name, but you can't put the ID to be whatever you want. Why? because the project ID has to be globally unique so that it is the only project in all of GCP around the world with that ID. And that means you definitely will not get my dash first dash project as a project ID, because that is taken. That was taken probably on day one of GCP, right? By some Google employee. So if you're naming this R Medicine 2024, you uh, somebody has probably beaten you to that. So you might, need to append a random number to the end of that or append a word. Um, you can do it like a Docker container, you know, entertaining platypus or whatever sort of uh, fun random words you want to add. Um, but just don't name it something embarrassing because you will need to use this. And once you set it, it is immutable. It cannot be changed. Um, so give your project a name, uh, go with the ID that's suggested, or you can alter it. And you can leave organization as no organization and then hit the create button. All right. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen and show you what that looks like. I'm going to pull over. Uh, this is uh, what my GCP looks like. I don't want it to be in my first project. I want a new project. And I'm going to call this RMED 2024 workshop. 
And it gives me this project ID RMED 2024 workshop. I guess nobody beat me to it. So I'm gonna leave that alone. If I wanted to, I could click edit and change it. Uh, but it looks like it's globally unique already. It's not giving me a warning and I don't need any organization. So I'll hit create. And you can see my notifications, it's cooking, 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 it's thinking. Great. All right, so the project was created. And if it's if it wasn't already selected, I can use my drop down menu here and select it. RMed 2024. And if I click on my dashboard, there's a little bit of information sort of about that project. RMed 2024, the number, the ID. All right. Um, so we're uh, close to the end. I did sort of propose um, having a uh, a three minute uh, a three minute uh, creation here, but I feel like that's actually uh, probably already complete. So I'm going to go ahead and go on. Um, let me pull chat up. If I'm going too fast, though, please let me know. Uh, but I think I talked more than three minutes, so you probably were able to do that while I was blathering on. All right. Once you are in your project, in other words, the uh, project selector has your project name in it. You can then click the burger menu, which is in the upper left. It's the three lines. And BigQuery is probably already pinned. And by pinned, I mean it has a little thumbtack icon. And pinned means it will stay at the top of your menu. It will stay visible more easily. Um, if it's already pinned, you can just click on BigQuery. If it's not pinned, um, you can click View All Projects. I'm sorry, View All Products. And BigQuery can be found within Analytics. You probably do want to pin it, so click that thumbtack, and then enable the BigQuery API to add BigQuery to your project. So let me show you what that looks like in my project. I'm going to click on the burger menu. Uh, BigQuery has a thumbtack in it, so that looks correct. So I'm just going to literally click on it. All right. Oh, interesting. Sometimes uh, I've seen it, uh, it, there'll be a, you have to activate this. Um, it could be that I've already activated in, in another project, um, but it looks like um, it's not going to prompt me to activate. You may see something uh, that says um, activate uh, the, the API. So, uh, and if it says enable or activate the API, uh, go ahead and do that. So, and so we're going to run into a, a few of these, uh, which I didn't anticipate, which is, I think, depending on how you answer the questions, uh, when you first sign up for GCP, you may or may not get the Gemini AI bot. You may or may not, there may be some slight differences here uh, with what you see. So we'll just take it as it comes. Um, but it looks like at least one person uh, has what I see and can see, oh, there's some interesting uh, there's an explorer here on the left. We're going to spend a lot of time in this explorer uh, on the left. Uh, and then there's this pane on the right, which is much broader. And we're going to spend time creating queries and looking at data in this pane on the right. Um, you can see uh, I have already done some work as this identity. I created this identity a few weeks ago to sort of practice for this workshop. So you can see I've got some recently opened. I have a little bit of history here. You will not have that. Uh, but there's some interesting information here about how you can add your own data. All right. So let me go back to our slides. And we're going to add some public data. So um, you know, uh, some of you may have personal uh, you know, passion projects that you're working on or work projects that you want to work on. Um, but uh, in the interest of having data sets that are interesting, uh, medically related, but not private, uh, I decided to add some, uh, pri some, per some public data sets from BigQuery, where Google shares these large data sets with folks. Um, and they handle the storage for free. So in your Explorer panel, 
uh, at the top, there's a little plus sign and add. Um, so you're going to click on that and you'll see a, a really long menu that gives you lots of ways to add data. Uh, you can add data from Amazon. You can add data from your computer. You can add data from a SQL database. You can add data from Google Cloud Storage. Lots and lots of uh, information on how to add data. But you want to go down to additional sources. And about a third or a half of the way down, you'll see something that has a shopping cart in it. And it says public data sets. And I want you to click on that. Uh, so this is what that looks like for me. I'm going to click on add. Um, and there's lots and lots of ways to do it. And I'm going to, I'm going to ignore the top things here. I'm going to look in additional sources here. Scroll down, scroll down, public data sets, and click on that. All right. So once you are in public data sets, um, I would like for you to look for the area deprivation index. And you can do this a couple of ways. You can uh, use the filter, the, uh, the category filter, and select healthcare, and that will reduce the number the overall number of data sets that you're browsing, and then you can find the area deprivation index there, or you can use the search bar and search for it. Uh, so what I'd like for you to do is find that and then click on view data set. So you'll find the data set, you'll click on it, and then there's a blue button that will say, would you like to view it? And I would like for you to do that. So I'll give you two minutes to get that done and I will check the chat. All right, so hopefully you have found the area deprivation index. You have clicked on view data set and you see a lot of information about it. Um, so this is what you should be seeing. You might see uh, something like this. And in the view data set screen, you're going to see lots and lots of data sets on the left. Uh, blockchain, Bitcoin, Census Bureau, something about Catalonia. Um, and among them, you will see Broad Street ADI, and it will be highlighted. And we want to indicate that this is important to us. So if you see that little star, I want you to click in that star so that it's filled in. And that will indicate that that uh, particular data set is important to us, and we want to use it in the future. So star that data set. Um, and now you, you probably have a couple of tabs at this point. Uh, so go back uh, to the tab where you can search for public data. Uh, or uh, if you don't have that anymore, click on that Add button again to reopen the Add Data and find that public data link. Uh, and I'd like for you to do the same thing. Uh, find, view, and star the CDC births data. So go ahead and do that.
And I think what I'll do is I'll stop, I'll, uh, at one minute left on the timer, I'll, sh I'll do the same thing in my project to show you what that looks like. And I'm also aware we're at an hour, so we're going to take a break pretty, pretty soon. All right, I'm going to go ahead and come over to my marketplace here. I'm first going to look for ADI. I'm going to click on it. Ask to view the data set. And oh, it's already started. Um, Wait, am I in the right? Am I in the right workshop? Okay. Maybe, uh, maybe I was sleep doing work or something like that. All right. So let's do this. I'm going to go uh, back to add more data, and then I'm going to go into public data sets, and now I'm going to look for births and see if I can find the CDC births data. I can. I'm going to view that data. And I bet it start as well. Hey, it is SDOH, Social Determinants of Health, CDC, Wonder and Natality. It is both start. All right. So hopefully that is the same for you. Uh, and so why do we, uh, why are we starring these data sets? Um, so if you uh, go back into your, uh, if you were to look at your resources um, in BigQuery, uh, a lot of times, like if you were go to, to go back to your original tab here, you can see I don't have anything under RMED 2024 and all of those data sets, those public data sets don't exist. Um, and that's because there's so many of them, they're hidden by default. So we star them, uh, this is just something that I like to do. I star them so that then I can select show starred and then they appear. These two data sets that I chose that are of more interest will appear under big, big query public data. Uh, so for me, it's a helpful shortcut to sort of show all of my data in one place. All right, so um, I invite you to also select show starred only. Um, and hopefully you will see Broad Street ADI and SDOH CDC Wonder Natality under there. Um, and you can also expand these little triangles. Uh, the sideways pointy triangle can become a downward pointy triangle. And you can see that within projects, there are data sets. And within data sets, there are tables. Uh, tables and views, but what we see here are all tables. Uh, so go ahead and expand those, and you should see three tables in the ADI data set and seven tables in the CDC data set. So let's take a break. Uh, so far, you have uh, created a GCP account, created a new project, added BigQuery, uh, found some public data, and started. So uh, I'm going to give you 20 minutes that you can use as a full break or a break and extra bonus work. Uh, so you can either relax, or if you want, uh, you can experiment with interrogating Gemini, if you have that. Um, you can look around at other public data sets. You can try some of the other add data methods. If you have data that is not private, that is not patient data, um, but you know just some public data that you have, or a, a CSV of like the seating chart at your wedding, um, any 
anything that you have that is not protected data that you want to add to BigQuery to practice adding data, um, uh, you can do that as well. So um, this is just a chance to do a little extra if you want. But uh, if you just need a break and your brain's been going all day, take a break. And I will see you back here in uh, 20 minutes. Oh, importantly, um, I will also be taking a break, uh, but I will be around for the first five minutes. So if you have a question, you want to put it in chat, um, I will, you know, take a look and be able to answer in real time. Otherwise, uh, when we all get together, I'll address all of those questions at once.
everyone, this is your one minute warning. Grab your last cup of coffee and come on back to your computer. I, I think I might've figured out Gemini. I put something in chat. We'll see if this works for people. In the meantime, let me pull up my next slide deck. And I'll put the starter slide for the second hour as well. I'll put that link into chat so you have it available. All right, welcome back, welcome back to our second hour, a uh, little bit more than an hour uh, of uh, this workshop, R and BigQuery, working in Google Cloud Platform. So in this second hour, we are going to be doing some data exploration. Uh, we're gonna spend a lot of time in SQL. Uh, and I think this is because, um, I think SQL is very, very important um, and for many of you who use R, being uh, capable SQL users really represents the next uh, big leap forward um, in making a lot of progress with really large clinical or research data. And then we'll talk about uh, querying in BigQuery. Don't worry, R does show up, but not yet. So bear with me. All right, so I'd like to invite you to uh, Take a look at some of these tables that are in your uh, in your project. Go back to your browser window, your incognito probably window that has BigQuery uh, open in it. And if you recall, you can expand data sets to show tables. So take a look at these tables uh, and click on one of them. So uh, I, for example, in this screenshot, clicked on area deprivation index. Um, by county. You can't tell that it says by county because my panes are not wide enough. Um, but I clicked on the first table under Broad Street ADI. And then some information about the table opens up to the right. Now, not every bit of metadata that shows up as tabs will actually have useful information. And that really depends on the source of the data, uh, where it came from, what it came included with. So for now, I want you to look uh, at the first few tabs. There's schema, that's the other orange arrow. Schema shows what columns or fields, those two words are interchangeable, columns or fields exist in the table. Then next to schema, there's details, which has some sometimes useful metadata. Uh, and then preview, which is also very, very useful. Uh, and preview allows you to look over the entire data uh, as if you were to issue a select star or select everything uh, query. So I'm going to screen share uh, and sort of walk you through this. All right, so I'm going to expand Broad Street ADI. Uh, it's a little bit cut off. I'm going to move my, I'm going to use my dragger here and just sort of like click and drag my pane here to make it a little bit uh, wider. Um, so, oh, I think, you know what, let's look at census block group. Why not? because uh, I think that's the one I actually selected. So I can see that there's schema, uh, details, and preview. And these are the three that I really want us to think about. So schema is going to tell us a little bit here about our different columns, our different fields that appear in this table. Um, and it looks like it has lots of place identifiers. So FIPS codes, FIPS in the United States are uh, federal information sort of uh, codes and they can describe lots of things. FIPS apply to a lot of different kinds of entities. But in this case, these are unique ID IDs for different US geographies, like county or state or census block group. Uh, there's also the census, excuse me, there's also the area deprivation index percent, uh, which has something to do with the socioeconomic characteristics of that geographic area. 
And I can look it over, look over this schema and it gives me some good information sometimes, right? If the columns are well-named, which they do seem to be in this project, they can disclose some useful information. Sometimes the schema is not that great, right? Um, and sometimes you'll have other columns over to the right, like description. Uh, boy, it sure would be great if description were filled out. But uh, as often happens with data that you uh, are, is being shared with you, we don't have that, right? Um, which is too bad, but that is also quite typical. Uh, so that's schema. Uh, details, this isn't terribly useful to us, but it does tell us the number of rows, 653,000. Uh, sometimes there can be tags or other information or labels that does not exist for this data set. That's not a huge deal. Uh, not that useful to us, but that's okay. Uh, and we'll click next on preview. Now, the best thing about previews in BigQuery is that they are free. So in BigQuery, you pay not for the storage of the data, but for the processing power of the queries that you run. So how much data did you have to pull in and process? But previews are free and they allow you to look at the data for free uh, and get a good sort of overall gestalt of what, what is this data? What are some examples of how data might be stored? Um, are our county names capitalized? Are numbers in decimal or integers? Are there abbreviations, um, commas? What is the capitalization here? It gives us a little bit of an idea of, of what this data looks like. Um, and there's a little bit of pagination at the bottom here. So this gives me 50 results per page. I can change that. I can also go to the last page. I can go to the previous page. So you can just sort of experiment with that. All right, but let me go back to the slides. Nope, not that slide, this slide. All right. Um, so uh, please just take a look at those tables. I'm actually not gonna give you five minutes because I want to re recoup a little bit of time. No, oh, actually, no, because I want you to pick out some. I want you to pick out some fields. So I am going to give you a, a few minutes here. Um, so I would like for you to look through the ADI data and the CDC data, and I want you uh, to sort of see if you can get an understanding about kind of what this data is. And I'd like for you to think about doing a join, right, or a merge if you're used to that language in R. You have two data sets. And you want to find some common data that appears in both data sets. So find one or more fields that has linking information, data that exists in both data sets that you can use to link two data sets. Um, and that can be one field, could be two fields, uh, probably not much more than that. Uh, and find a couple of fields, one in the ADI, one or two in the ADI, and one or two in the CDC data set that you would like to sort of link to each other through this join data, right? Uh, I am just gonna give you three minutes on this. So we're gonna move a little bit quickly. I think it's helpful to be a little slow at the start because you can get behind when we're setting up accounts, but I'm gonna accelerate a little bit here. And you can tell me how the pacing feels. If it feels like it's too fast, let me know in chat.
All right. So hopefully you had a chance to pick out some fields. So we're going to take a little bit of a detour through a SQL refresher for those of you who know SQL and a little bit of a SQL 101 for those of you who are new to SQL. Uh, so SQL, you can say SQL, you can say SQL. It stands for Structured Query Language, is used to get information from a database that stores data in tables, right? So tables have rows, which are individual records, and columns, which are the values that are stored. So medical data is stored uh, in tables, uh, customer data is stored in tables, and SQL is the way under the cover that this data is stored. So if you use REDCap under the covers, it's SQL. If you use um, an EHR under the table, it, uh, it's uh, under the covers, it's SQL. Um, so SQL is a really handy thing to know how to work with. Uh, and especially if you're working with really, really big data, you can't always pull all of that data uh, into R or Python, right? So knowing how to use SQL is gonna be very helpful. So we're going to see this same pattern emerge, which is select from uh, and uh, sometimes where. So select says, which columns do I want? Such as select cabin, the column called cabin and the column called high score. From says from what table? Uh, so we're going to call this table camp kickball tournament and where gives any filtering for rows where high score is less than 10. So if you're used to using dplyr, you can think of select as select um, and where as filter. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, and aliases allow you to rename things. We will see this later. So you can see I say select cabin and high score and a new field that I'm creating, which I'm going to compute as wins divided by wins plus losses. And I'll use as to give that a name, prop win for proportion of wins. Um, again, with the from and the where clause. So we're going to talk about, we're going to use aliases. We're going to use select from where. Um, I have strong feelings about white space and capitalization. Uh, I think lots of people have strong feelings and they're often in very different directions. So uh, both of these queries, the one on the left and the one on the right do the same thing. They are equivalent, but I think one of them is much easier to read and uh, will make future you much happier at past you. Um, so lots of ink has been spilled on the right way to do SQL queries. Um, and I will just say, this is my opinion. Um, everybody has an opinion. You can take it or leave it. But my encouragement to you is to be consistent with whatever your white space uh, and capitalization uh, sort of methodology is. Capitalize keywords. Those are SQL special words like select, from, where, as, uh, join, um, things like that. Capitalize those words so they stand out. Use indenting uh, to make your clauses a little bit uh, clearer. Uh, and consider when you have a list, as I do here, of, of three particular fields, consider using a new line for each one. Um, again, this is opinionated, uh, but I think it will be helpful. So writing queries in BigQuery uh, can be a little bit tricky because BigQuery requires fully qualified table names. So this is one of those caveats. If you've worked with SQL in other places and not worked with it in BigQuery, um, this might be a, a smidge annoying. Uh, to reference a table, you have to include the project name, the data set name, and the table name separated by periods and enclosed in backticks. And this can be challenging to remember and hard to type. So my recommendation is to skip this headache by starting with the query button that has a magnifying glass. So when you're looking at a table, when you've clicked on a table, um, you can then uh, query it with that query button. And if you're zoomed in, like if you don't have a lot of real estate on your, uh, on your browser window, that might just be a magnifying glass without the word query. So if you click on that, um, it will give you the start of a query. So if you click on query table, it'll say, how do you want this query to open? 
Um, you can do new tab, you can do split tab, uh, do one of those two, uh, but you'll see a partial query. And the cursor will be located uh, right in the middle of from, uh, of select and from. And it's placed there so you can just type in a field name or two or three if you separate them by commas. Uh, but you'll also see that uh, there's red warnings that your query is invalid because it is in fact invalid. You cannot have a query where you have nothing selected. So because it's partial, uh, it says syntax error. You can hover over those red exclamation points if you want. Um, and I find the error messages to be fairly useful. Um, all right, so let's do your first query. Um, note, you might have to adjust some of the pane widths uh, to see all the buttons that you need to do this. So I'd like for you to look in your starred data sets and expand the CDC, the SDOH uh, births data set and look for the table called County Natality. If you click on that table, uh, then that sort of information will open up to the right that has all the information about the table. And you should see a query button. And if you click on that query button, I'd like for you to choose split tab, not new tab. Uh, and that's only just so you, you can experience seeing both the schema and the query open on the same screen. Uh, and you can use the schema, which has table names, excuse me, field names. You can add one or more field names from that schema into your SQL query right after the word select. Now, if you do this properly, you'll get a green check mark. Um, and if you get a green check mark, click on that blue run button. So I'll give everyone three minutes and then I'll demonstrate it. And if you've successfully done one query, do a couple more, get a little practice.
excellent. All right. Uh, so let me show you what this looks like. I am going to uh, go into this tab. Let me clear things up. Let me show start only. Uh, I want to go into county natality. There's my query uh, button right there. I'm going to click on that and say in a split tab. Uh, and that's so that I can have access to all these field names on the left. Now these field names are absolutely case sensitive. So I have to make sure. So let me uh, type year and then maybe a comma births. I got to make sure to spell it right. Birth. Oh, and look, if I keep typing, it'll give me some tab completion. I'm going to go with that births. And I, because I am sort of picky about my uh, white space, I'm actually going to just arrange this to be a little bit prettier. Um, and that limit 1000, that's fine. I don't need to see more than that. And let me click run. It is green. If I hover over the green check mark, it also tells me how much processing uh, will take place, which is how cost is assessed. So this is, uh, thousandths of a penny, I would say, if maybe hundredths of a penny. Uh, so let me click run. All right, and then I've got my query results below. Excellent. Uh, and again, I can choose to have as many results on a page as makes sense, and I can sort of paginate through these. I can also sort of sort here and sort of figure things out, you know, just play around with that. Excellent. All right, let's go back to the slides. Whoops. Um, so I know some of you uh, did not have the Gemini button on your uh, toolbar. I'm curious, do you have a little pencil and star icon? Uh, if you do have a pencil and star icon, that is the Gemini sort of co-pilot that will help you write code. Um, so, you know, this can be, this can be useful uh, to work with. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you this um, in case uh, you don't have it. If you do have it, you can do this along with me, um, uh, but I want to show it to you uh, just to see. I also put into chat, let me put it in again. There is something that I think if you activate it, some people said it works. Oh, it says enabled, but no new icon but it worked for me. Um, I apologize that I didn't realize it, that uh, Jim and I would not be uh, available for everyone, but I am gonna put a link uh, into chat to see if it works to activate in your project. But let me show you, um, if I'm looking at this data uh, in county natality, um, a lot of these make sense to me, right? Uh, I can sort of make sense of, of a lot of these. Uh, but if I were to look at, let's say, county natality by, more, by maternal morbidity. Um, okay, average birth weight in grams, that makes sense over a county, what's the average birth weight, fantastic. Um, but this, oh, I'm in the wrong field, sorry. Let me get rid of this. And let's look over here. Uh, average age of mother, that makes sense, but maternal morbidity description over a county. I'm not sure what that means. Um, I can look at preview and sort of get an idea. Is it a is it like the name of an illness? What What is maternal morbi morbidity description? So I can look at preview and sort of get an idea. Okay, none checked. It looks like there's a lot of none checked, but what if there is one checked? Well, are there gonna be rows here that say, uh, gestational diabetes? I don't know. Um, so how can I find this out? Well, I can do a query. Uh, and this, if you, uh, okay, now I don't have the Gemini AI uh, in this. So if you do have the pencil, oh, this is so infuriating. Uh, if you do have the pencil, you can actually uh, ask uh, Gemini to help you craft what your SQL query will be. So let me, uh, uh, I don't have a screenshot of this, unfortunately, but you can literally type in something that says, hey, uh, can you tell me what the unique values are 
uh, for maternal morbidity description. Um, and you can do that. Uh, so, you know what, let me just try this. Thanks for bearing with me in a live coding snafu. I'm just gonna see if I can activate, enable this in my project. Ooh, somebody just gave me a hint. All right, it says in, all right, let's see here. Let me refresh, reload. Query, any tab. Hey, I've got a little help me code. Uh, let me, so this is a little Gemini helper bot here with the pencil and the star. So I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to say, uh, what are the possible uh, values for maternal morbidity description? And you can see that I'm not even typing in the field name. I'm sort of putting it in English. And let's see how well it does. Because I, I feel like this has you know, it's going to be a SQL distinct, but it's been a long time since I've used distinct. All right. So let's see if this works. I've told you Gemini can be a little bit uh, uh, untrustworthy. So let's see. Now I could hit, click insert here. The problem is it's going to insert it in the middle of what I was already writing. So it'll be a query within a query, which is annoying and, and no good. So I'm actually just going to copy uh and just close that for right now yes please discard and i'm going to paste now will this work this query will process 14.67 kilobytes so let's just see here if that does the trick all right so it did give me something, but it gave me gestational age and week. So that wasn't exactly what I wanted. Um, but the distinct is sort of getting me uh, into the right uh, into the right neck of the woods. So let's make sure that I am in the right table to begin maternal morbidity. And let's query that in a split tab. And then I'll then I'll leave well enough alone. Uh, Give me the unique values for uh, maternal morbidity description. And let's see if it does, it's gonna give me the same thing back. Nope, it's trying, it's trying. It knows it wants, I want something distinct, all right? So you can see that it's, it's really struggling. Um, but let's do this, let's go into County natality by maternal morbidity dot. And let me get that. And I'm just going to replace county natality with county natality by maternal morbidity. Um, and what field did I want? Maternal morbidity desk. Maternal, and let's see if tab completion will help me. Maternal morbidity desk. All right, and let's run. But just by helping to give me distinct, it got me a, one step closer, all right? So now we see there's three options, none checked, at least one checked, or unknown or not stated. So this Gemini, sometimes I found it helpful, sometimes I found it infuriating. So your mileage may vary, uh, but it might at least give you vocabulary to say, oh, distinct, that's the keyword that I was looking for.
All right, let's go back to slides. All right, and we're going to, to use what you uh, gathered earlier, those, those fields that I said we were going to use in a join. Now, why uh, am I promoting the use of joins in SQL? You may already be very familiar with doing joins in R or merges um, if you use the merge functionality. Uh, you know how to take two tables in R uh, and join across them to get data that matches on those two tables. So why am I encouraging you to learn this in SQL? Um, well, sometimes you're working with very large data in BigQuery, millions of patients, let's say, and your cohort, you're really looking for a specific cohort of patients that's only 15,000, but you have data that has millions of patients. Uh, and maybe you have another table that has uh, tens of thousands or millions of rows. And it's just not feasible to bring those two tables into R and do the merge or the join in the R language. Um, and in fact, the way I like to think of SQL is as a really heavy duty tool. Um, kind of like it's, if you were to sculpt something out of wood, uh, you need a chainsaw and you need chisels, right? SQL is the chainsaw that gets rid of a lot of material that you are not going to use because it's fast and powerful. Um, you could potentially make a very small sculpture out of a very large tree using only chisels, uh, but you would maybe wear out your chisels, break your chisels, and lose patience. So I, I really want to encourage you to try doing joins in SQL, even if you typically would just say, oh, I'd like to take both of those whole tables over and do the data combining in R. Um, so bear with us if you're typically more of an R person because I think this is truly a good uh, learning experience for you. So when we're doing joins, we have three things that we have to consider. Uh, what to join, and that's sort of decided for us in this case, is ADI data and CDC data. And I asked you to look at a couple of fields. Uh, maybe you want to link uh, the area deprivation index to, uh, uh, to neonate uh, weight, to birth weight or to maternal morbidity or something like that, right? Does, is there a correlation between socioeconomic realities and birth outcomes? Um, so what fields do you care about? Then we have to think about what constitutes a join. So what is a match, right? In our case, it's really, does the county mentioned in the ADI row match the county mentioned in the CDC row? The county needs to be the same, right? Uh, and sometimes there's more than one field that's involved. And finally, which type of join? Uh, and by which type of join and which part of the Venn diagram? Um, this is a very common way of describing this. It's a little bit simplified. But if we think about two tables, in English, which is the language that SQL was developed in, we write from left to right. Um, and so left, in joins means the first table you mention and right means the second table you mention in your query. So left and right are just in left to right language. Which one do you mention first? Which one do you mention second? So, you know, we might have some, uh, we might have some counties that appear uh, in both data sets. We might have counties that appear only in one or the other data set. Um, and so which of these overlaps do you want? Do you want only counties for which both uh, data exist? Or you really only care about area deprivation index. And if you have the CDC data, that's great. You'd like it, but it doesn't have to exist for that data to be useful um, or vice versa for the other data set. Um, so thinking about which part of the overlap you want. So if we think about ADI and birth characteristics, um, what, what do we want? Uh, we have county level data about uh, socioeconomic risk score, and we have county level data about birth characteristics. Uh, so if we wanna join these together, we have linking data, um, either the name or the FIPS code. I'll tip you off that matching on uh, numbers is usually a lot easier 
than matching on words because of capitalization and punctuation and spelling differences and spacing and things like that. So I'm going to encourage you to use FIPS code to join this data, to link it. And what kind of data completion do we want? Well, let's say we're doing a little bit of a correlation analysis and we want to see um, how ADI might predict birth uh, characteristics of a given geographic area, right? We want to predict how much, uh, how many resources we want to pour into neonate clinics in this area. Uh, and ADI information can help us make that prediction. So we really only want data uh, where the counties have both ADI data and uh, birth information data, because that's how we can set up that correlation, that relationship. So we're really interested in that overlap, that middle part of the Venn diagram to show some statistical relationship between ADI and birth characteristics like birth weight. Um, and so if we think about the various kinds of join, what is the join that has just the overlap? If we go back, that is the inner join uh, or the just plain join. If you say join without any other descriptor, by default, it is the inner join, the overlap of those Venn diagrams. So the syntax of a join um, is select whatever fields you want from, you enter a, uh, one table name, and then you have some join keywords, and then a second table name. And then you have to describe your join criteria. So I'm not sure what you chose when you looked at that those fields, and I asked you to look at those fields. I couldn't predict, because there's a few different ways you could do this. But let me show you what I came up with. I thought it would be interesting to link the area deprivation index to the birth weight in grams. And so let me work from the bottom up and describe this query. So line seven, and line seven kind of wraps around. You can see it's two lines long. Um, I have the two tables I want to join. So I've chosen to put the ADI index by county first, or on the left, and the county natality table uh, from CDC on the right. And I want to do an inner join because I only want data uh, for counties that exist in both data sets. And then on my line eight, I'm describing what is in common, what matches on these two. All right. So uh, the county FIPS code, which is a number, it's called two different things, right? In one table, it's called county of residence underscore FIPS. And the other table is called county FIPS code, but I kind of took a look at it and it, I'm pretty sure it's the same. So I'm gonna give that a shot. Um, and then I wanna think about what data do I want? Now, strictly speaking, I only really need the ADI and the birth weight, the two things that I'm putting in relationship with each other, right? To do a statistical correlation or to do uh, like a, some sort of uh, modeling or graphing, those are the two things I need. However, when I'm doing a SQL query, I find it very useful to put some sort of um, checks in place to say, is this join doing what I think it's doing? Uh, and so I like to put the county name from both tables in, in my query, just so I can pull up Kind of, am I actually matching? Is the FIPS code actually doing what I think it's doing and, and matching? All right. And then if that works, uh, in subsequent uses of this query, I might delete those, those first three fields because they're not really necessary. They're just there to sort of reassure me and show quality uh, in my query. So let's build this query that I built together. Uh, and if you feel confident and you're, you're uh, you've got some experience in SQL, feel free to not do what I'm doing and do your own join with your own question. Uh, but I'm going to show you um, how I do this um, using sort of the two fields that I'm interested in. So first I'm going to open one of the two tables I'm interested in. So I am going to use start only. I'm going to go into Broad Street and I'm going to go into 
area deprivation by county. Let me close some of these tabs that I'm not using. Close, close. So I've gone into area deprivation by county uh, and I'm going to click on query. Um, and I will do this in a, in a split tab, why not? Are you gonna do it for me? There we go. All right. And so, but I know I need two tables. So how am I gonna get the other table? Um, so this is boilerplate and it's just one table. The first thing I'm going to do, let me ex let me make my screen a little bit bigger for you. That should be a little bit better. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of my limit. And I'm gonna type the word join. And if I want to add, uh, let's say the natality, the CDC table here, um, I don't have to retype it. What I can do is find the table, county natality, and there's this three dot menu, we call this the kebab menu. And if I click on the kebab menu, what I can do is say copy ID, and then put some back ticks in place there. And then between the back ticks, I'm going to paste. And so now I have my two tables joined. So that's good. But how am I going to join them? How will I know what's what? So I'm going to type on and what needs to match? The county needs to match, right? So I'm going to start typing county and just see if, if uh, this completion, this code completion helps me. It does. So I want County of Residence FIPS. I'll choose that first. And that needs to match County FIPS code. And I could put that in either direction. It's an equality. So it doesn't matter which direction it goes into. So I'm really close now to finishing my query. But I need to go between select and from um, and say, which fields do I want? So I'm going to start typing some fields. And again, I'm going to let autocomplete help me here or tab completion. So I'm going to say count, whoops, not sound, county. Uh, how about county name? That might be helpful. All right. I'll put a tab there, make it look a little bit nicer. Um, and maybe a county of residence, which should be the county name from the other table. We can see if they match. Uh, maybe I want to put both the FIPS code in. Uh, they should be the same though, because I set that as inequality. So I'll just put one in, county FIPS code. And then what are the things I actually care about? I care about the ADI, the actual index, right? Um, so let me start typing area deprivation. Oh, that's the one I want. And um, the weight, which I think starts with average, average uh, birth weight. Let's do that. And will this turn green? It will turn green. Uh, so I can run it. And I'll copy this too, so that you can have it in chat. All right, it's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking. All right. Okay, so interestingly, uh, in one of my data sets, the state is not mentioned and the other it is, but it does seem to be matching, right? Lynn County, Polk County. So it seems like the match is doing what I want. And I can see my area deprivation index and my average birth weight. So this feels like a, uh, a, um, a join that I can feel confident about. So I'm gonna paste that long, uh, that long uh, query into chat so that you have it. All right. But here's, an, here's a question for you. Why is, why is the same county appearing over and over and over again? Any ideas, any guesses as to why I, I keep seeing the same county over and over again? This is gonna be a problem in data analysis, right? Because what if I have one county in there 10 times and another county in there five times? Some of my counties are gonna be overrepresented in my model. What's going on here? Any, any suggestions for what might be happening here? Well, what's going on here is dates, right? We have multiples of counties. 
and some of them have varying ADI scores. So the same county will have different ADI scores. And what's going on here is that we have various years of data in the ADI table. Um, so uh, we, I tried a little bit with Gemini here. We've already worked with Gemini. So I'm just going to like uh, jump past uh, this a little bit and say, uh, what we can do is we can do multiple join criteria. Um, and so let's, let's try this. Let's go back into this query. Which one is it? Which of my many tabs? This one. Let's put an and here and let's say date. All right, there's a lot of date time, date time, date time. So I might actually need to kind of open County Natality uh, and look over here and see year is what year is the one area deprivation index it looks like all right and then let's look in county natality come on expand there and it has year uh capitalized so it's not date it's year so let me i'm going to try my first what if year matches year let's try that year with an capital is the same as year. Let's see if that'll work. Uh-oh, I already have an, uh, a problem here. Column name year is ambiguous. Yep, this happens because it's named, you know, except for capitalization, it's the same. Uh, so I'm gonna put some aliases in here. I'm gonna call this as ADI. And I'm gonna call this as CDC. And that way I can refer to them instead of with that whole long name, I can refer to them by their short names. All right. So the CDC is the one that has the capital. So I'm going to say CDC.year equals ADI.year. All right. There's still a problem. What is our problem? Let's, let's hover over and it says no matching signature for operator equal sign for argument types date and int 64. So what's going on here? Date is a type that has year, day, and month. So one of my data sets has a date. So if it's 2018, it'll it'll say 2018-01-01, the first day of January of 2018. The other data set just has a four digit year, 2018. And I can't compare those two data types. Um, so I did a little Google, um, and this is just a helpful hint for how to understand how to get the questions answered that you need answered in uh, BigQuery SQL. Include what you're trying to do, and the phrase in BigQuery. So I asked, how can I extract just the year from a date column in BigQuery? And uh, it looks like extract will be likely to do the trick. All right, so I am going to copy this and paste it into chat, and I will paste it into my own, uh, into my own query window as well. And you'll see that essentially what it's doing is taking one of these uh, years and using extract to get just the year out of that. All right, because if we look at the CDC database, it says year, right? It, but it's a date type. So when we look at that, the year is actually a whole date. It's always January 1, but it looks like whoever created this data maybe a whole date instead of just the four digit year. So how are we gonna deal with that? We're going to use extract. All right, now this is green. How much will it process? Usually when I hover over, it tells me it's not today, but it is green, so I'm gonna run that. And this gives me uh, the grams uh, the birth weight in grams and the area uh, deprivation index. 
Again, though, I'd really like to put in a couple of other things. I'd really like to put um, maybe the year uh, and maybe the county name just to be on the safe side, right? Uh, so let's do, um, we'll do adi.year. Uh, and let's do adi.county name. Put some commas there. Uh, and let's do CDC dot county of residence. And that way we can just make extra bonus sure that we're getting the data that we expect. That gives me the year, the county name, two different ways of saying the county, but they certainly seem to match the birth weight and the area deprivation index. All right, now we've got data we can actually work with. All right. So. Uh, one last thing before we move over to R, uh, we've been doing a lot of work in SQL here, and this has been a lightning fast sort of uh, introduction to SQL, is we're going to have to do some, uh, some thinking about dates uh, because we matched on date, but what if we have multiple dates represented? In other words, we're now matching and saying, hey, make sure that you're putting 2018 data from CDC with 2018 data from ADI and 2020 data from CDC with 2020 data from ADI. We don't want to mix and match, right? But what if we have several match pairs? We have a pair of data for 2018. We have a pair of data for 2019. We have a pair of data for 2020. We still want to be selective and say, just give us the most recent year. And that requires grouping and aggregation. Um, that I am going to do in R, however, uh, not in SQL, because I think we've done a lot in SQL already. Uh, we've done a lot of effort. I do want to draw your attention um, to a resource that I added, and I added it actually like in the middle uh, of, of uh, our workshop today, because I realized I wanted to include it. Um, let's see here. Where is my readme? Ba, 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 ba. Let's see here. Uh, I have some additional materials uh, that I am going to pop in here that will help you with SQL. If this little uh, teaser into SQL has been something that you've wanted uh, to learn more about, uh, I popped into chat a resource and I'm going to open it in my window as well. And these are self-service sort of, um, you know, do at your own pace learning modules. Um, and this is self-promotion. This is my team built these. Uh, and if you look at pathway three, big data, big questions. Um, this is really for people who are interested in EHR and other big databases. And it includes what is advertised as a gentle but thorough introduction to SQL. So it goes much more slowly and in a measured way than I have done today. Um, so take a look at that. And you can see demystifying SQL, just learning more about it, understanding how tables are set up in SQL, some basics, some intermediate, some joins. And each of these is a very relaxed pace. You can see each of these is an hour, right? Uh, so if that is of interest to you, I really encourage you to take a look at that. Um, because I think that might be very useful for you in acquiring more skills in SQL. Uh, all right. That said, uh, before we leave BigQuery and go into R, uh, we've worked really hard to build these queries and we want to save our work, right? Um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to save our query results. Um, to do that, Remember that in BigQuery, the structure of data is that there are projects. Inside projects, there are data sets. And inside data sets, there are tables. So we can't jump just to creating a table right away. Um, we have to actually create a data set uh, and then add our table there. So I'll walk you through this, but I want these slides to be here for you for the future so you can remember what it looks like. Uh, we'll, we're going to create a data set. 
and then we're going to create a table. Um, so let me let me walk you through what that looks like. Um, I have uh, created here, which should be is here. Uh, I ran this double matched on county and on year data set. And I got a, a query result that I really liked. It's got the year, the county name, uh, and the data I really care about, which is birth weight and ADI. So how can I save this? Well, I can click on Save Results. And I want to save it as a BigQuery table. All right, so I'm going to click on BigQuery table. But I don't have a data set. There are no data sets within my current project. So I'm going to create a new data set. And I will give it a name that or an ID that makes sense for me. So I'm going to call this ADI CDC births. And I might have 10 tables in this data set at some point. So I want to be kind of vague. Um, I don't want to get down into its birth weight and ADI and it's on counties in Alabama. No, no just ADI CDC births. And I can get more specific in the table name. Uh, I don't have to do any of these extra bonus advanced options. I'm just going to create data set. All right. And now that data set is selected. What is my table name? This I might say birth weight and ADI or give it some table name that makes sense to me. And I'll click Save. And now I have in my RMED 2024 workshop project, if I expand, I now have a data set called ADI CDC births. That's new. And if I expand there, I have a table. So out of those hundreds or thousands of rows, I now have uh, the specific data that I want to analyze saved. The other thing you might want to save is your actual query. So building a query takes time. What if you realize you want to make some small changes to this query? Um, or you want to save this and then make a couple of changes and save a different version of it and see which one you like better. Um, having a bunch of tabs open or copying and pasting this into a Word document is a terrible idea. Uh, it would be great to save it within your project. And we can do that. I'm actually going to click Save and click on Save Query. And I don't have to give this a really parsimonious name um, as I would a table name. I can give this a long English name, like write a sentence. So I can say something like uh, joining ADI and CDC data on county FIPS code and year includes some sanity checking columns. So I can give it a nice long name. Um, and because I haven't done any regional work yet in my, uh, in my project, uh, it's going to invite me to figure out, well, which region do you want things to be saved in? Um, U.S. Central 1 is fine for me. You want to choose something that's relatively geographically close to you. Uh, this is the default, so I'll just go with that and click Save. And now all of that work that we've done is saved. If we close our window, it'll be there. And you can see under RMED 2024 Workshop, I now have my shared query joining ADI and CDC data. So I could close all these. And if I wanted to go back, I could open that query, and there it is. All right. Um, so that's where we stand right now. So we've saved uh, our table, and we've saved our query. We've looked in our resources, and we can see that our query is there, and our table is there. Um, and so let's take a break. Uh, I've thrown a lot of SQL at you. Uh, it is R medicine, and I haven't let you do anything in R yet. Uh, so let's take a break. Uh, let's do just 10 minutes. Um, I think we've we've done a lot of building the groundwork, so the last about half hour should really fly. So let's take a 10-minute break. Um, I'll be around for the whole 10 minutes if folks want to ask questions in chat. Um, 
otherwise, uh, relax, get yourself a, a cup of cup of joe, um, ask uh, any questions you have, and I will see you back here in 10 minutes. Ah, of course, this is silly me, Joel. I did, a, I did something very, very silly. I copied and pasted my code and my code. Um, uh, oh, actually, so my code includes the big query public data. It doesn't include our med 2024. Um, when you're trying to save your query, um, I was wondering if what I copied and pasted included my project name, which you don't have access to, but I don't actually see anything where I'm including my, uh, my project. Let's see here.
All right, hopefully you are within sound of my voice and you can come back to your computer screen. We are about to do our last portion of this workshop. Thank you so much. All right, let me close some of these tabs here. Uh, I need you, I don't think so. All right. All right, I'm going to bring my query back and I'm going to run that and then I will be up to speed with all of you. Let me make this a little bit smaller and let us jump into our last little bit of this workshop. So, so far, what have you done? You've signed up for GCP, created a project, you added BigQuery, you looked at public data and uh, another project, the BigQuery public data, and you use that data to create a query and a table doing some relatively sophisticated SQL code. So what's left? Um, exporting your data, uh, exporting the table that you made for use elsewhere. That's one way of uh, integrating your work is just literally export it as a CSV and go run with it. Um, however, I really like connecting directly to BigQuery from our studio so that the provenance of your data and your analysis is really clear and reproducible so that from your R code, uh, you reach into BigQuery, grab that data uh, and work with it in an automated way. Uh, we will not get to Vertex AI Workbench today, uh, but the slides are there for you uh, if you want to look at it uh, at, a separate, at a separate moment. Um, so let's take a look at uh, our data. We saved a table um, as you recall, mine is called birth weight ADI. I'm not sure what your, yours is called. And so it sure seems like the export button should export it, right? That would make sense. But if I click on export, all of these export options are to things within Google Cloud uh, platform or within the Google environment, right? Explore with Google Sheets. No, I don't want it in Sheets. I want it as a CSV. Explore with Looker Studio. That's sort of a visual dashboarding. No, export to GCS. Scan with data loss prevention. I don't want any of these, but I want it as a CSV. How do I do that? Well, uh, you can't uh, export a table as a CSV. You can, at least not directly, it's not a single step but you can do that with query results. So if you were to run that query, um, then uh, in your results here, where it says query results, you can save your results. So you can save it as a CSV to your Google Drive. You can save it as a CSV to your local computer. Uh, this is where we saved it as a BigQuery table, if you remember. You can save it as a Google Sheet or even copy it to your clipboard, which is generally probably a bad idea unless it's small data, which this is. Um, so I want to show you that so that you know how to uh, download that as a CSV. But what I really want to spend time on today um, is working on um, working directly within R and tapping right into BigQuery directly, all right? Uh, so a quick reminder here. So R is a language, as you know. Um, it's a language that can be deployed in lots of different ways and lots of different places. And one of the places you can deploy R is within the very heavy duty um, R Studio IDE. So R Studio is a fully featured IDE that many of us love and it runs on Linux, Windows, and Mac. Um, but there's lots of other places you can use the R language, uh, such as Jupyter Notebooks, for example, which we will not get a chance to get into today. Um, why, am I, why am I defining this difference for you? Uh, because you can spin up an R Studio server in GCP. You can say, I would like a virtual machine, please, and the type of virtual machine I would like is a Linux machine and I would like for you to run R Studio server. And that's a lot of steps and you can do that, um, but you don't have to. And it also might mean spending money that you don't need to spend. 
because you can use your normal R Studio, the R Studio you already use on your computer or uh, your account in posit.cloud to work with BigQuery. So you're using R Studio that's outside of GCP and you're reaching inside GCP using some authentication. So uh, let me get this link for you, this link address. Uh, if you use uh, uh, posit, uh, or actually this is just uh, right within, this is just the, uh, the, the markdown from GitHub. So you can copy this uh, and get the code and plop it right into posit.cloud uh, or into your R Studio. Uh, sometimes folks have different uh, packages installed with their R Studio on their own desktop. So you might have some issues. Uh, maybe it, you might not be able to install the big R query package. If that happens, try using Posit Cloud. So please open whatever R Studio you typically use, whether that's R Studio on your computer or Posit.cloud. And when you get there, open a new Quarto or R Markdown document. Dealer's choice. You can do what you want, Quarto or R Markdown. So I'm going to start a timer, but I'm going to actually do this along with you. Uh, I like posit.cloud. So I'm going to go to posit.cloud and log in using my typical, which of my many identities, this one. And I actually already have a couple of projects here. So while that's booting up, I'm going to go back to the slides, see where we are. So I opened our studio. I did step one. Step two is open a new Quarto or R Markdown document. Um, so I'm actually going to, um, I'm going to get rid of this untitled project and I'm going to do a new project. Uh, and I will say uh, a new R Studio project. And I'll change this to live demo. And then what I want to do next is open a new Quarto or R Markdown. And you don't have to use Posit. I like it. I think it's useful. Uh, but you certainly don't have to if you don't want to. Hmm. I'm not sure why it's not showing me our studio here. I might have to go to a different workspace. I spoke too soon. There it is. All right. File, new. I'll use Corto document. All right. So now I have a new Corto document. I'll call this live demo. You can call yours whatever you choose. All right. This is a new project. So I'll go ahead and install anything that Posit is telling me that I should install. And I'm going to go to source because that's how I like to work is from source, not from the visual. All right, so there are a number of ways that you can, from within the R language, connect to BigQuery. Uh, but the way that I'm going to show you uses a library called Big R Query. Um, and I like this because this is a Hadley Wickham project. Uh, it's a high quality, written by Posit. Um, I've very seldom had any issues with it. Uh, and usually the issues that I've run across have to do with actually GCP bugs on their end. 
Um, so I really like this, uh, this library. It's not the only way, but it's, it's the way that I like. Uh, so if you have, so please install big R query. And if you don't have tidyverse installed, go ahead and install that. Um, and then once we install those, we're going to do library on both of those as well. All right, so I will do that with you. It's big R query. So I'm going to get rid of all of this boilerplate uh, and install. And I'm going to do a new code chunk there and install packages. And I'm going to say big R query, all lowercase. And I happen to know that this does not yet have uh, tidyverse. So let me do that. And then I'm also going to do another code chunk and I'm going to say library, big R query and library tidyverse. So I'll run both of those and that'll take a minute to run. It's going to have a lot of dependencies. But I'm going to install big R query and I'll copy that and drop it into chat so you have it. Uh, so I'm going to install those uh, and then call library. All right, now we haven't talked really a lot about security um, and authentication, but your project belongs to you and you alone, and you can give permission uh, for other users to see it, but that is something you have to add. So we will also have to do some authentication. Um, so you are going to type just BQ underscore auth, uh, open close parentheses, and this is going to start an interactive process um, that will allow you to authenticate. And importantly, you will need to authenticate using the same Google identity that you're using for your GCP project. So if I use a different email address to authenticate, it'll say, you're not joy.rmedicine.2024. You don't have permission for this. Um, also, if you run this and it suggests installing HTTP UV, uh, do that because it is pretty useful. All right, so that finished running for me. So I'm going to add a new code chunk and I'm going to type BQ underscore. And the first thing that comes up is auth. Uh, so I'm going to run that. Uh, and there's a little interact interactivity here. Uh, so let me go back to the slides and show you the interactivity and then I'll walk through it. Uh, so first uh, it'll ask, do you want to store or do you not want to store your credentials? It's I usually store my credentials. I think it's fine. Uh, my sessions, I want to work back to back and keep those uh, credentials uh, across sessions. So I do. So I say yes. And then it will ask you to sign in with the correct identity. So make sure you're signing in with the same identity that you used for GCP. Uh, then you have to give some permissions. And then you'll either uh, get an authorization code or it might automatically authorize you, all right? Um, so I'm going to say yes. And you can see it opened a new tab. This is how I wanna authenticate. Uh, I'm gonna hit continue, yes. Yep, that's totally fine, continue, all right? And I should have uh, stopped my screen share, I didn't. Um, so I'll, I'll, this, I'll close down my account regardless, uh, but I'll copy this to the clipboard. It's actually many, many characters longer than what you see on the screen. Uh, so I haven't burned my, uh, uh, my token just yet, uh, but I am going to just sort of uh, pull my posit off screen for a moment uh, because it's, what it's gonna ask me here is enter authorization code. And I don't want you to see me entering the authorization code. So I'm gonna take this off the screen share. I'm gonna enter that code, hit enter, and then I'm going to clear my, uh, clear my console. And now I am authenticated, all right? 
So I am authenticated and ready to go. Um, so now that I'm authenticated and I see, I know that Joel is having an issue. Um, I'm, I'm just wanna keep going in the interest of everyone else. And then maybe we can catch some time um, afterwards. But uh, are other folks able to get to BQ off? If you have been able to install big R query. Yep. Oh, I didn't realize I needed to stop by five by 520. I thought this went to 530. My apologies. All right. Uh, well, I've got three minutes. So let me quickly uh, go through the last bits of these slides. Um, so once you're once you're authorized, the pattern is you need to set your project ID and your MySQL query objects. So project ID is whatever your project ID is in GCP. And MySQL query is whatever the text is of that SQL query. And then you'll send that query to BigQuery and then get the table back using BQ table download. All right. So um, also, Peter, I'm not a host, so I can't stop the recording. Um, but if there's somebody who is a host who is able to, I will let them stop the recording. Um, so let me grab this code and I will show you what this looks like. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy and paste the uh, project ID and the query. And I'll just take all of this and paste it into my posit. Now, how am I going to get my uh, project ID? Here it says your project ID. I can go into my Google Cloud uh, and click on that Google Cloud logo. And on my dashboard, it will tell me the ID and it has a little copy to clipboard. So I'm gonna copy that to clipboard and paste it in my project ID, just like that. So now I can run, this is my project ID. Uh, this is my SQL query. This should look familiar to you. It's literally just copy pasted. And then I say, please BQ, can you query this? Project ID, my SQL query, and that's the results. And then I go and get that data. And there's my data that I pulled in. Now, what I didn't get a chance to go into, and I'll stop here, is I didn't get a chance to, to show you how do I get only the latest year, uh, but it's uh, this is standard dplyr. Uh, I can also check my work. And how can I visualize this data? This is standard easy ggplot. And then create a linear model and see, is there some sort of correlation there? Is there a, a utility in this model? All right. So by using big R query, I can pull in data that I've worked on in GCP and bring that into my own R Studio, whether that's on my computer or um, through posit.cloud. Again, apologies for uh, my throttling. Uh, I uh, did not uh, plan my time as well as I could have. Um, and I will stop there so that we have time to stop and let the next speaker. Oh, thank you, Lee. Oh, great. Now I'm the host. Uh, yeah, so I did not stop and restart recording in the beginning, Peter, because I couldn't. So apologies, like all the recordings are glued together at this point. Um, so, uh, but I will uh, stop recording if I can figure out how. Stop recording. All right.